that's about the only green thing that's here. I thought I'd just have a few minutes to show you how dry it's been, okay? I like to grow some zinnias every year, and if anyone doesn't know what zinnias are, here they are, okay? These are my favorite plants, okay? And I grew a load here, and a load around the corner, and um, now we have a hose pipe ban, and you're not allowed to water any flowers or anything. So what I'm doing, I'm watering these with washing up water, and it is all pretty amazingly dry here. So I just want to show you this. This is, this is the lawn outside my front, and I don't think I've ever seen this so dry. Today we are about 32 degrees again. Everything is basically on the point of dying, okay? You can see this box hedge I've got here that I planted years ago, and it's grown really slowly, but it's amazing how this tolerates it. You see the outside has gone brown, but if you look inside, inside has still got green but look how dry that is it's just hanging in there the problem is where i live here this we're right on top of like uh, the highest point in the area and it's very stony so you can imagine the minute it stops raining everything dries out but i've managed to keep my few zinnias going because that's what really does it for me um we can't top up the pool this pool we bought 20 years ago okay and it's a kit pool and I've just kept it going. I put it in myself. Um, I had to buy a new pump for it this year, but it's still running now because I topped it up before the restrictions came in, but we're not allowed. They are absolutely adamant on it that we can't top it up and all that. So what I'll do is when we can't use it anymore because it gets too low in the level of the filter, I'm gonna use it to water all the plants in the garden. But that probably isn't necessary because this weekend, the weather's gonna break. So all this will hopefully get some moisture. And the thing is, the temperatures are gonna finally drop. So we've had approximately three solid weeks now of really high temperatures. This is the, this is the what we call the Shaman. This is the little really old kind of workers, uh, farmers tracks that, that go around a lot of the houses and that's my barn owl box by the way was also a disaster this year because they seemed to raise one chick the other two eggs didn't hatch and then they ate the third the only chick that hatched because there was just no food around so what I'm trying to say is you can see with just on this track alone how dry it is there's absolutely nothing, no moisture, it's baked dry, most of the trees have lost a lot of their leaves. It, we're at the point now where we're almost like four weeks earlier into the end of the summer, autumn. So this is a bit of grass I have that I kind of keep as a cut area and I haven't had to cut this for probably three months now, 12 weeks, because it is so, so dry. There is just nothing. You can hear the grass. Aren't those crocs just the sexiest thing out? <laughs> but anyway, I'm just, <laughs> you can hear how bad it is. The trees are all losing their leaves because it's just their way of shutting down and coping with the drought. And even though you think, oh, they're losing their leaves, it was the end of the growth season anyway because trees generally grow for about three or four months every year and they don't generally grow much more. So, um, why am I not pulling my honey? Well, because it's been so insipid, the heat, and because it's really not a great idea to be in your hives when you are got temperatures in the, way, in the high 30s, which we've had. I mean, yesterday was again 37, it, it touched again. It wasn't as high as two weeks ago when we had 41, but it was still pretty high. So what I've done is decided just to wait. Now I might lose a bit of honey. I might lose a bit of honey from the overall crop, but you know what? What the hell? 
I would rather harvest comfortably and know the bees aren't stressed than have a major problem and put myself through a load of grief because I've been keeping going to the gym, I'm going to the gym in the morning and that itself is an epic task. But I'll show you this. This is the second one I found. Wasp nest. And I am removing this one. This will be dealt with tonight because we have so many wasps. I know they do a good job. I know they're part of the ecosystem, but you get a year like this and the balance is completely, completely out of kilter. You know, we've got Asian hornets, we've got wasps and they are in their massive numbers. So this is obviously down the bottom of my garden. The bees are flying a bit. I put a second body on my Mini Plus and they're growing into that because these are queens I got earlier in the year that I gave a second body to give them more space to grow and I could split them if I can get some queens in about three weeks. I might just split them in half and then that will do, then they'll grow for the rest of the year. But overall, all you see around here is nukes I've made and hives and spare stuff and hornet traps that are full, but I have been treating the hornets. I've been giving them a dose of chemical and it seems to have made a big difference because the numbers have dropped. However, we are still seeing quite a few. I filled these traps up yesterday and there's still Asian hornets there. It is having an effect, but I could spend every single day going into every single apiary, filling up all the traps, filling up all the traps and it just keeps happening, keeps happening. You just have to keep on top of it. But, uh, um, yeah, it's just unbelievable how dry it is. I cannot wait to start actually harvesting. I want to get that done out of the way. I want to get the honey off. I want to, because I've got to get the honey off because the first queens I caged are now been in 21 days. So I need to get the honey off to be able to treat the bees. So that is a problem I'm having. And, and we basically had three weeks of this weather and it's been a nightmare to be honest, to, to kind of keep going and keep your energy going. And I'm glad that I have done what I've done now because I feel I've been more productive inside. I've had a lot of paperwork to do. Uh, we call it la rentrée, which means all the kids going back to school. But even though my kids are older, I still got grant films to fill, uh, grant forms to, to fill out and things like that for my son and my, well, my two sons. Um, it's never ending basically. So I've had chance to catch up on that so that I feel that when I get the chance to start doing my um, harvest next week, I'll be able to go at it full pelt and just get those clearer boards on, work through the whole lot. I reckon I'll be able to pull it in about a week. So uh, yeah, it's because obviously I come down here and I'm looking, this is where my building will go. I've had the okay from the digger guy. He'll come and level the area and prepare the surface, that's the two ends there. The other two ends are over there. So one by the building and one there. So he'll come and level all that in October. In November, the stonemason will come and start the slab. Then I'll be working with him to get all my pipes in for the underfloor heating system and all the pipes in for the electricity and the water because they all go in tubes, which will be great, which will save a lot of overhead cabling within the building later on. So I've got to do a floor plan for the electricity and a floor plan for the water and a floor plan for the water to come out, obviously the evacuation we call it, for the drainage. But it's pretty simple because the septic tank's going to be just outside the building and the runoff will go away over into there, which has all been agreed. We had to get that done. I mentioned this before, we had to get that all done before the plans were finalised and were submitted. So that's all in place. So overall, it's looking really great. I've just got a few minor details to sort out again that has cropped up. There's always hoops you have to jump through with every product, project, I should say. But overall, um, I'm, I'm really pleased. I'm just, re I, I've never ever had a period like this in my life where I felt so frustrated that, that nothing is kind of moving, but I've got work to do that I can't really do. It. And if you go and work in this weather, it's just crazy temperatures. So, um, yeah, but you know, I'm looking at other beekeepers on the heather 
in the UK now and it's, they're having a terrific time. It looks like they've got a fantastic flow, which is great news. My friend I visited in Ireland, Ollie Nolan, Ollie's, Ollie's farm, he's had an amazing year. Um, other beekeepers I follow, um, they're all going through different things. Ian Steppel is having an amazing flow right now, but boy, has he earned it. You know, we've just all got different times of the year we have to get on with. We have a severe dearth this year, but we have a severe dearth without rain. And I think for us, regarding Varroa, that is going to help me because when I go around and start my treatments next week, I've noticed a lot of queens are actually slowing their laying down anyway, whether they're caged or not. And the problem I've had this year is finding queens to cage them hasn't been easy. Um, I, uh, often I've, I've had to just forfeit the cage in the queen, but I make a nuke from it and move on. And that's what I've had to do because it's been so hot and you, can't, you can only afford to spend so much time trying to catch that one queen because you've got another 10 to do in the apiary and you've got to get those nukes moved quickly because you can't leave them in the boxes for long because they'll overheat. It's just blah, 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 blah. Process, process, process that's stalled on many different levels because we're not used to this dealing with this type of heat. And I mean, I, I see these guys in Texas, you know, Texas beekeepers, all that. They're like, what, what are you talking about? We deal with this all the time. I'm like, well... We don't, we're not used to it here. So um, I'm also going to look at getting a ventilated suit for next year. Because I think that's the way to go. I think that's going to help me a lot in the times of hot weather. But next week, we are right down to 23, 24 degrees C, which is way better than 33, 35. So it's going to be a completely different ball game. We're going to have some rain around, but the rain won't impede me anywhere, no matter how heavy it is, because it's going to take so long to soak into this. This is just... You know, it's just dust. It's, um, you know, it's absolutely incredible. But, shall I say it? It is what it is. So anyway, there's a little rundown of uh, where we are. Uh, my truck's been here for three days now, loaded up with some nukes. There's loads of bees flying around. I've got my feeder buckets there. I'm nearly out of feed. I've got to go and fill them all up. I've got barrels there, I'm hoping I'm going to fill. Everything's kind of ready. I'm just getting other things organized and I'm kind of using my time wisely. So it, within a few days, I really will achieve a lot if we get those better temperatures. And I, and I think that it will be a good decision to just kick back a bit and go, don't worry about it. You know you can do everything, which I know I do. I've got the time to do it. And I know I've got all the everything ready to go into place. So um, bee escapes, so I've got 50 this year, new ones, so they're ready to go straight out and they should work pretty effectively. Because don't forget, I've made lots of splits with the colonies I'm taking honey from. So I know there's a, a few less bees, so they should all go through. You know, sometimes you get those colonies that are so big that you put a bee escape on and you really have to do, if you've got three supers, for example, you've got to pull two of them and put a new super underneath on top of the third super at the bottom just to give the bees space, otherwise they don't go down quick enough. A bit like, as I say, like Ian Stepler does, it's really good to see that because he gets his bees down really quick because he gives two supers underneath instantly. It's like the bees know, know nothing different. But for me, um, this year I shouldn't have too much of a problem because I think the queens have slowed their laying right down, the numbers will be falling, obviously the varro is increasing, but most of the row will be phoretic because of me caging or because of me being able to attack those varroa because the queen has slowed her laying down. So I'm hopeful, I remain optimistic. I seem to get through last winter pretty well with relatively, flu, flu, relatively, flu, relatively few losses. So, you know, we just have to see how that goes. The nukes are looking great. The ones I've made are good. Uh, the Asian hornets that have been stalking them are, are under control. Um, I'm going to be working on that. As soon as I've got this honey off, then that's my next mode is going to the apiaries because right, uh, in about two or three weeks, those bees are going to be making those winter bees. And that's when you, when you start to give life support to your apiaries because I'm going to go in, in there. I'm going to be taking out those hornets. I don't actually mind them building up a bit at the moment. This just sounds weird. But I don't mind that because what a presence of Asian hornets do in front of the hive, it almost stalls the queen laying. The, as well as the dearth, with a building up presence of Asian hornets, the queen is under stress and the colony stops laying. So, it, And also it gives me a chance to have a load of hornets to trap and treat and then release again. And they'll go back to the nest and the nest dies. It will give me more leverage to, to, to carry out that really effectively when I come to do it. 
So that's got to be done at a certain time, quite precisely, because we don't want a, a load of Asian hornets in front of the nest from really from mid-August onwards, because that's when they're making your winter bees. So it's all about process, all about that, even though there's nothing to do, there's still loads to do, you know. And I'm going to really struggle in my veranda this year because the wasps are getting into everything. Um, I'm taking out as many nests as I can because it just reduces the overall load on all the hives and on everyone. I mean, my family have all been stung several times just because they're not, they're just after sugar. Wasps are just total sugar merchants. They're just into everything. They're always around. You know, you, one goes on down your shirt and under your arm and you get stung in there and, ah, oh, you know. They are absolute little devils, you know, pain in the ass, to be honest, but you just have to get on with it. So my, my number one thing is getting the harvest off next week. Number two is then starting the treatments. Number three is treating for Asian hornets. And there's a lot of work ahead, but if we get reasonable weather, everything's achievable in the time zone. So I don't have to worry really anymore about the building. I may still get into the building for February, March next year. So. so just to add to the video I made this morning when it was like blazing sunshine, we're just nice and calm now at the end of the day and it's a little bit cooler, slight breeze. I wanted to talk to you about uh, the spring honey that I took and I showed you harvesting, but not the first harvest. That was the, the rape, the OSR. That was taken off and we had a really good spring harvest. This is the second harvest I took when I showed you how I went back to the hives and I was surprised to find there was a second harvest in the hives in most hives not huge but still about 180 uh, so about 450 kilos so worth taking so I sent an, an analysis off I sent two 125 mil pots off to this company in Belgium who do a lot of the French honey analysis and it's called Carrie there's the address. So that's what we use uh, in France. I'm sure they do, obviously, Belgium, they do other countries nearby. So I sent off the uh, analysis and I asked for the basic analysis. Plus, I was interested in finding out what the levels of polyphenols were in the honey. Because when you get high tasting honey like buckwheat, it's said to contain lots of macronutrients and extra antioxidants, which buckwheat does. But I'd also heard you get it in some other honeys that were quite strong and pungent in flavor. And we'd had a lot of, um, uh, what's the word, white thorn we call it, or Crotagus monogyna, which is the flower at the end of the flower season. We call it um, hawthorn, that's the word, hawthorn. Just slips me for a while. But that didn't show up in this report. But the overall, report was a complete surprise to me. I was expecting it to show apple and to show maybe the tail end of OSR and possibly, um, what else was in flower then? We had um, uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, mo mostly apple. I said to you, I think mostly apple, but there was one other thing. I'll come to that in a minute. But the surprise was this honey was actually and if you can see that, was actually a miela or a honeydew honey. So a honeydew honey is a result of bees going off onto the leaves of trees and shrubs and plants and taking the honeydew that is emitted from aphids. So basically they are harvesting the excreta from aphids and the aphids were in prolific numbers this year in the spring because we had a good a nice warm spring then it, there was lots of moisture in the ground and the aphids did really well and the trees produced lots of sap because the weather was not warm so the aphids grew quickly and then they when we'd had the main bulk of flowers that had finished the uh bees then moved on to something else they could find and as i said so many times our nectar flow stops bang like a curtain about mid-may so that was what I've always said, and it's confirmed this, because then the bees went on to something else. They went on to what they can find on the trees and, and on the shrubs and everything else. And what this proves is when you have the good weather 
and when you have calm conditions bees will forage on honeydew and honeydews from aphids and we've seen it before a few times we found a few combs in the strongest of hives of an extra honey and we're like well i'm sure i harvested this and we're like maybe it came after but we just didn't pick it up so but that's what it must have been and a lot of beekeepers around here say they've never seen it before and i've certainly never seen it in my house before but i've never seen it sorry they say they've never seen it in 20 years it's an extremely rare phenomenon and it might be something that ha now happens more often if we get this pattern of weather continuing where we have a great spring and it just carries on the good weather but the summer flow is not much perhaps that second nectar flow or the change of the bees from one load of plants to the aphids to the miella or to the honeydew is going to become more the norm but it's interesting so i'm going to go over for this a little bit um the 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 long and the short of it is um the plants that also showed up in here were nothing that unusual but it confirms exactly what it is so we still had quite a lot of brassica type plants. In other words, there was still pollen coming in from the rape, but it was 65%. And there was also chestnut pollen coming in, but 14%. So you had 65% and 14%. And the other pollens that came in were from the following. So you might have seen one I talk about, what's called wild carrot, or it's the, it's like ladies mantle, they call it. There's that. We had holly turning up, uh, which was in flower then. We had um betula pendula in france they call it bullo but it's basically um birch okay birch tree so you get the catkins that hang off that was at that time um flowers from the pinks family so it's campanula and carnations and stuff like that uh we have in here also buckwheat that turn up as well so they must have been but that covers the buckwheat family so it might have been some earlier types that weren't the one that's sown uh plantains were in flower a lot that's in there um got potassium i didn't look that one up but we've got also trifolium which is clover that turned up um alder alder and alder buckthorn which is one willow um buttercups which is the ranunculus family obviously rubus which is the bramble family and visia faba which uh, which is basically beans okay and the beans were in flower at the time the that's the one i was talking about before that couldn't remember the second one we had i thought it would be apple and i thought it would be beans field beans that are sown because they were all in flower then but that was very very minor the interesting thing was it was really from what the bees went out and found when they're out and about because there was aphids in the good weather that were feeding on the leaves the succulent leaves then not the leaves we've got now that are all weathered and leathered so that's just interesting because it confirms the hum I was also worried that the humidity was going to be a bit high. Uh, we've got 16.9 there humidity. That's a confirmation. And I've got the confirmation as well because the um, uh, obviously there's no fermentation. And, and I did the test on my own little device. I can't remember the name of it. I always forget that. Um, but it just proves how useful doing a analysis is and the analysis cost me about 90 euros because i've got the extra bit done to talk about the polyphenol level but to me it's really good to start doing a few analyses of your honey because people that are buying my honey at the moment are asking things like well what's the polyphenol level what's the antioxidant level so polyphenols are basically compounds in whole foods and in the plant-based foods you can buy that were kind of are becoming in vogue at the moment not because it's the latest real fashion because reality is showing us that whole foods and these compounds that are found in plant-based diets are really so much better for us because they contain antioxidants and antioxidants are the things that go around and mop up all the undesirable um, chemicals in our body in a nutshell you can go into it there's masses of stuff um huge amount of stuff obviously everyone's got their own preference on what you eat 
I'm not going to say it's you know, but if you want a good diet, you're not going to go and say, well, I'm going to I'm going to eat two pots of honey a day. That's not what it's all about. The whole thing about changing your diet these days is about balance. It's about encompassing what we think now is a good thing to eat with a balanced diet and eating less so that you're burning what you're using you're not storing fats you're making your all your organs work properly with what they've got and just not overindulging that's how me i think it works and it's just nice to find that from my marketing point of view we can find in our own honey that we're producing a wonderful product that is completely natural and it's containing high levels of polyphenols so I'm really pleased about this and what I'm going to do following getting this is I'm going to get my buckwheat tested when I harvest that next week and the week after and I'm going to I'm going to report back and tell you the, to compare the two because I want to start building a dossier it doesn't mean the next year I'm going to do the same test because I'll know if we have if by freak chance we do have the same weather next year I'll know that it's likely that if we have a second spring harvest it'll contain high levels of polyphenols and I'll know that if we if I have a buckwheat crop it's pretty likely going to contain what the results will say when I do the test in the next couple of weeks but anyway that's just a little bit of background I'm delighted that we're getting um, some interesting data on the honey that we're eating and believe you me you can pay a lot more and actually get an in and more in-depth look but I, I just don't feel it's any not really necessary but it's good to prove the where your honey is coming from it's good to prove it's showing up all the right markers that would prove it's from where you're harvesting it from and to me that's worth every bit because i can confidently say to people here's here's my honey talk about it and also show them the results so anyway that was really interesting and uh i'm really pleased that i'm able to get these results fairly rapidly it was only i think um, six weeks ago since I sent the results, maybe seven. But overall, good. It's just good to kind of go down the road of understanding what we're actually dealing with. Anyway, from that news announcement, it's over to you, back to harvest your honey, back to me harvesting my honey, and have a good week. Speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.